You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. Hey, Paul, you might remember a couple of years ago that there was a big, um, big deal because everyone was going to the movie theater because, well, as you know, uh, the movie Is Genesis History was released in actual theaters and it was kind of a big deal. It was pretty exciting. Um, I had the privilege yeah. of, of actually being interviewed for that film. And I'll tell you, it's a pretty weird experience to to sit in a dark theater and see your face up on this big screen <laughs> after you've paid for a ticket to get in. I, I always paid for a ticket because I thought we, we have to make sure this movie does well. Um, so I never never did any <laughs> never did any bonus bonus view, uh, viewings of the film. Uh, and then to stand outside, I I always I when I would go to see it, and I saw it every time it was uh, on screens here. Uh, locally, and I would stand outside the theater and just smile at people as they went out, waiting to see if anybody recognized me. <laughs> Is that vain? Am, am I vain? I don't know. <laughs> Your five minutes of stardom. Yeah. I, I've only I, I was only recognized twice by by at least that I could tell. Some some elderly ladies were pointing and and talking amongst themselves as they left the first screening I saw, and then one in Tennessee. Some guy goes by and goes, hey, are you that tiger guy, and the, the, the zoo guy? And I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so anyway, that was my fond rem- memory. That was some of my fond memories of, of his Genesis history. Well, today we've got a very special guest with us. Um, the goodness, the producer, director, writer, mastermind of his Genesis history. It's Thomas Purifoy. And he's been on the show before, but welcome back, Thomas. We're glad to have you here. It's great to be here with you. I remember that being in the zoo well that day, the day the Lord <laughs> made all the animals do what we wanted them to do. So, <laughs> playing yeah. a gorilla, yes. he basically, yes, the, the gorilla, exactly. yeah, demonstrated his gorilla ness. Yes, so. he was very gorilla ish. <laughs> I'll have to tell that story sometime. We also had the, the glory of wonder of realizing that we've chosen a zoo that's far too close to the airport so we were stopping yes. stopping every 10 minutes as planes would go over <laughs> yes so it was twice as twice as much work as i think we we were supposed to spend but well thank you for joining us thanks for coming back what what was your title on there did i get them all producer writer oh, director yeah, that's right that, that's right whatever you, mastermind you missed, I, you missed probably also like best boy for carrying things <laughs> yes, and you that's know. Right. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> craft services because I also was the one who, you know, handled all the, made sure I got where we were got to eat. I mean, I lived in France, so, you know, food's really important. Actually, I had a producer tell me when I first started in this business, he said, the number one most important thing is if you're, he goes, you may not be able to pay people great, but make sure you give them great food because they'll yeah. be happy. That's, that's right. Yeah. If you feed people well. And we went, we went to barbecue, Memphis barbecue when we were filming. We're in Memphis. You got to do barbecue. Yeah, exactly. That was was amazing. (laughs) Well, this is great. So we've brought you on here because we know that you've got a new movie in the works and it's, uh, it's kind of a sequel, kind of a part two, kind of a new direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the movie? What's it called? So the film is called, we kind of have, you know, your prior titles on the front of it is Genesis history, but we're, we're calling it mountains after the flood. Okay. And it's a little strange as you're right. It's like a sort of sequel sort of, not. it's kind of a 1.5 maybe, <laughs> um, primarily because, and yeah, here's, what's funny. So when we ended our first film, we ended in, you know, the Rocky Mountains and Dell makes kind of a throwaway comment. You know, the other he says, you know, all this that we see around us was, you know, formed by the flood. And I true. We didn't really think much about it when it was done. So years later, when we started into this film and we'll discuss how I, you know, ended up with the footage came from Andrew Snelling's research trip down to the Grand Canyon that was filmed and was given to us. But we'll, 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 that'll come up. The point is that we realized the film was ultimately about the rise of the Rocky mountains, um, or at least that played an important role in it. Kind of this event in earth history. 
And so strangely enough, I think the Lord kind of knew where we were going at the end of our films. We kind of make a mention and, you know, if you know that to look for the link, that, that that's how we got there. So the film itself, though, really explores, I kind of think, well, I think I, you and I have mentioned this, that the first film was something that I kind of came up with by looking at what are the, all the arguments of young earth creation. So how do we do a flyover and really pull 360 degrees? We want to go all directions, give somebody in 90 minutes, yeah. 100 minutes, kind of an overview. This is a film that came to me and really is a look of saying, how does creation science work? So all these guys that we interviewed in the first film, well, how do they come up with these ideas? You know, you know, what is creation science? And then secondarily, well, okay, well, what was going on after the flood? Well, these are kind of the two big areas that we kind of land on with this. So it's not a huge overview of you know interviewing you know 13 different scientists or so forth. Rather, it's carefully following a few scientists and digging into their work and then showing kind of how do they, what are the implications of it and, and how does that play into, into the bigger picture? Wow. That sounds like it's going to be quite a thing. And I, I guess you're right. It's not really a sequel. It's more like you've create, you're starting to create a, a cinematic universe and is Genesis <laughs> history <laughs> cinematic universe and... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it is kind of curious because like when we got it, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the, the story we ended up. So just the backstories, Andrew Snelling um, had this research project in the Grand Canyon. He's been wanting to do for years. And this goes back, I think actually to, you know, the, the 2014, 13, so forth. He had put in this permit with the Grand Canyon. They were like, Hey, you're a creationist. You can't do this. And which is totally worldview discrimination. he, uh, Contented Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, Gary McCaleb, a fantastic lawyer. He's the one who ran the case. Gary sent a, started to send a few letters out for Freedom Information Act. Things came out very clearly that this was a, a um, uh, worldview discrimination. And I think they realized that they were going to lose the case. And so they said, why don't we let him go take his samples? So he went down to the Grand Canyon. Actually, it was the summer after we released the film. Um, so 2017, and he took John Whitmore as, as his assistant. And he went down and basically they, they had a uh, cameraman go with him, Hilton Metzger. Uh, Hilton um, worked for Alliance Defending Freedom. And he gave us a call and said, hey, Andrew Snelling said to call you. You guys have filmed in the Grand Canyon before. What equipment should we take? I was like, well, you could take this camera and you might want to do this. And, you know, we gave him some advice. So literally about two or three months later, we get a hard drive in the mail. Hilton's like, hey, we filmed all this. How you like to see it? And we were in the middle of, of editing Beyond His Genesis History. Another sequence that you were in, uh, featured in uh, often. In fact, we may have been doing, you know, who knows? We could have been at the, by the time we were there doing this, it was volume two. We ended up throwing it in a, in a safe and like, okay, great. Thanks. You know, skim through the footage. Wow. Look at all this footage. And then didn't think about it again until 2019. And for some reason I began to think, hmm, is there a film here? And originally it was like, let's make a buddy film. You know, it's, <laughs> Andrew Snelling and his buddy yeah. John Whitmore yeah. and Tom Bale, and they're going down the Grand Canyon. We tell them their backstory and da 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 da. And we start talking about it, and that's how it, it was because it was wasn't my film to create. It was like the, we just received this footage, found footage, so to speak. Well, around that time, a um, little thing called COVID happens, yeah, and yeah. we're like, "Well, great. Well, we can't travel and do anything." So we start thinking about this. This kind of starts noodling on me, and I start talking to Andrew about the project. And that's when I realized, well, maybe there is a film here, but it's more than just, you know, Andrew's research. But the question is that, you know, his research project was taking samples of these enormous folds. I probably should have mentioned that. The bottom of the Grand Canyon, huge folded rock uh, layers in the very bottom of the canyon, which means creation model. These are very, you know, first flood rocks being laid down. Um, why are they folded, you know, 10 stories, 15 stories tall, huge, enormous, even bigger folds? So my question was, so what causes folds like that? And that was what then pulled the thread. They're like, oh, well, that was the Laramide orogeny. Like, well, what the heck is that? <laughs> so we start moving into this question of like, oh, wait, I suddenly realized these are major post-flood movements going on, which were linked to water coming off the continents, which is linked to the world after the flood. And that really interested me, that whole world. Yeah. So I was like, well, maybe there's a film here. And so we kind of start slowly moving through 
And that's kind of how we ended up for three years filming on this thing. But it's a much more like a classic documentary where you're trying to figure your story out and, oh, well, maybe we should interview him. Well, maybe we should go back and interview this guy again. Well, maybe we should take him somewhere else. And that's kind of how we ended up with a film. So it's very different sort of a film. And people who have seen it so far, we had a premiere. We had some donors, you know, through a crowdfunding project, which we can talk about. A lot of them were like, I don't really know what to expect, but this is not what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a different sort of a film. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I yeah. all have seen it. I mean, what did you expect when you were kind of watching it? I mean, I'll, I may push it back, but I'm kind of interested. What did you expect? Hmm. Yeah. Paul, what did you expect? <laughs> I don't know that I had any expectations. Well, well, I, I'd heard a bit about the, the movie and the backstory to it anyway. So I think I, I already had my expectations kind of primed uh, somewhat. So I sort of knew what the backbone of the film was, but yeah, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was great, great to see that footage, you know, for, from Grand Canyon. I've actually been there to one of those folds to the carbon Canyon fold. And I, you know, when I when I watch this uh, footage, I just it just makes me want to go back to the canyon. That's <laughs> that's my main impression. Is I would love to get back there. You know, I haven't been for a few years, and wow. uh, yeah, 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 it's a great place to visit. Yeah, so seeing it for you, the first time, it's stunning, and to watch what these guys were doing, and 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 really, yeah. I mean, honestly, that was when uh, we don't bring it up in the film, but that was it's it's quite dangerous what they're doing going up in there and trying to climb up on this cliff face, and that was actually where. Mm -hmm. Andrew actually injured himself. It doesn't come out in the film, but you can at some point you can kind of see a a little band aid yep. appear on his head, uh, yep. and a few band aids on his arms, and so that's why as he made a joke at one point, he said the reason you always take a spare geologist is sometimes the main geologist gets broken on the way. So John ended up doing almost all of the real, shall we say, heavy lifting, but all all of the, the sampling um, was done with John and, and Tom Vale. I mean, wow. so you see Tom and John throughout the whole camera or throughout the whole canyon doing most of the, of the actual sampling. Yeah. Well, maybe we should, I feel, I feel a little, feel a little uh, lost I, uh, just because I'm not a geologist and I can't really appreciate the depth of all of the geology. I have not been down into the Grand Canyon except for a small hike along the rim Um so to me, you know, seeing the canyon from that angle is pretty sweet. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. And I don't know that I'm ever going to get there. Um, but I think, I think it would be good for us. So we've, you, you gave us sort of the, the, the overview of where this thing is coming from. And it's very different from the first film in the sense that you went into the first film with a very clear vision about exactly what you wanted to do and exactly what you wanted to capture. And I remember you sending out these scripts to everybody for the interview this is the these yep. are the topics we want to talk about I'm like okie dokie that sounds good um it's very much like the way we do our podcast we ha we have very clear ideas about <laughs> what the episodes are going to be um yep. but yeah let's talk a little bit about the actual content of the film so you've sort of hinted at these 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 giant folds and some something called the laramide orogeny Yes, I don't even think that comes out in the film, but that was <laughs> Good. the first thing that was said. It's just we've we've had to deal. So that's one of the first problems we've dealt with mm -hmm. is this actually film is more complex in its topics. So complex that it was difficult for people even to explain what it was about. And like it's actually there multiple yeah. times. So I'm like, okay, Andrew, uh, Snelling, John, we're just gonna explain this, and it takes four or five minutes. So I'm like, okay, so that's hard for a sound bite. What we've realized that I've got, I've kind of, you know, had to kind of deal with this at a very simple level. What the film is about is looking at layers uh, that we would argue that layers at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And the question is, when did those layers form? And ultimately, the story is about how did creation scientists examine those layers and look at evidence within those layers to say, actually, we think these layers happened very, they were formed very recently. And there's evidence within the layers that show they were formed recently. And if that's the case, then they can't be, you know, in this case, the layers they're looking at at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, it's something called the Tonto Group. That means okay. basically it's just a series of, you know, you've got three main layers of, of sediment that are in there. Um, the Tapete Sandstone, um, which would be the largest, you know, think of sand. And then you've got the Bright Angel Shale, and then you get the Muav Limestone. And so all there's different types of, of materials within those in general. You know, you've got a lime mud, you know, a shale, 
um, would make of a, of a mud stone. And so you've got this ascending or shall we say a descending level of, of size of sediment. So, you know, your largest is at the bottom and your, your thinnest, your finest at the top, which is what you would think of with any kind of, of, of a large uh, of, um, waterborne sediment carrying event, which is what we would say with the, with the flood. But what makes it interesting is that those layers um, are folded or bent like sometimes 90 degrees or sometimes they are bent like a snake. And the question is what causes that? So conventionally they would say, hey, these layers are, you know, 500, five, around 500 million years old. But the folding event didn't happen until over 400 million years later during a major mountain building event in the Western United States. And so this is the conventional view is that, hey, we know that they're very old and we know they have these folds. So we guess there must be something that enabled them to fold like that. And very conventionally, if you're not even conventionally, just very, you know, from a physical perspective is you can't bend a big old rock. It's like bending concrete. Um, you just can't do it. So the idea is that, well, it could be done possibly if you had lots of heat and pressure in a very unusual circumstance is the argument that's been made. Well, if you have heat and pressure, then you're going to somehow affect the chemical insides of that rock. Mm -hmm. um, and so the result is, is Andrew says, hey, well, great. Well, if that's the case, I'm going to go down and look inside the rocks. But to do that, you've got to take samples and you've got to take samples and then you've got to cut them real thin and put them in a little, you know, tiny, tiny, real, real thin little thing called a thin section. So you can look at them in a microscope and say, well, did it change? What is the What's the internal composition of that rock? So that is what the film kind of is the root of it, is this following Andrew's uh, path of getting the samples, um, preparing the samples, having the samples sent out to uh, his friend Ray Strom, who is one of the, you know, really an amazing uh, petrographic um, analyst and who um, in Calgary, Canada, makes the thin sections. We filmed all this stuff along the way and then have them get the thin sections back. He analyzes them and talks about it. So that's that's sort of the spine of the film, if you will, or even better, let's make it a, a better metaphor. That's like the Colorado River of the Grand Canyon that you follow <laughs> along. That that That's your main story. But then you have these side canyons that you go off on mm -hmm. that begin to discuss like, so, okay, well, if that's making these, so how were they made? So, okay, well, there's a whole history of the, basically of the flood um, and a history of what the flood did to the earth there. There's a little bit of a post-flood history. When are these things happening? Well, we think they're happening when the flood was ending and maybe after the flood a little bit. And then that then takes this whole view of how did creationists talk about this post-flood world and how do we know the flood was ending? And so we ended up going with John Whitmore, who kind of carries this. He looks into the world of geomorphology, you know, a good Scrabble word, but the <laughs> geo, the earth, and morphology, the shape. How does the earth get its shape? And this is what really interested me. It goes back to a conversation I had with my, I don't know what was it. So my, my films are often come from conversations with my daughters. I mean, it, it, it's just very, very simple. My first film was a conversation with my middle daughter about, you know, what is evolution? And this is a different history of the earth. This film in many ways was, goes back to my daughter coming to me one time and she goes, well, where do the Rocky Mountains come from? You know, how does that fit into this whole creationist view of the world? And because they're really big. And what, what, were they before the flood? Were they after? Well, what does that mean? Yeah. So. The argument is, is that, well, they would have been rising toward the end of the flood. And the reason that we have Rocky Mountains that are these high, rugged mountains is because the flood didn't erode them away. And so that they stayed when maybe the rest of the mountains, like the Appalachians, which were rising maybe in the flood, they got eroded. And you can start looking around the world. You're like, this is very interesting. There are certain mountain chains that are high and rugged. Andes, you know, part volcanic, the Himalayans, the Caucasus, the Alps, all part of a chain here. Well, those actually would have been very late flood post-flood mountains and they didn't get eroded away. And oh, guess what? They fit at the same timing as this event in the West that's linked to these folds. So it became very complex, all wow. these interesting interconnected pieces that you look at this, as Andrew says at one point in the film, we're going to take this little thin section, this microscopic thin section, and go to the formation of mountains. Well, <laughs> From a filmmaking perspective, that's very difficult because you're having to create a link of all these events and you kind of need to know this, to your point, Todd, geological information yeah. that your average person doesn't know. So right. in a sense, this has been a more challenging film to put together 
because it's a single linked argument that kind of goes on and off that you got to go back to the same point. So right. it, in a weird way, it's not fire hose, like all these different directions, rather it's this, okay, I need you to eat this meal and then this meal. And by the time you're at your sixth course, you're like, whoa, I'm feeling rather full. No, no, I've got another course or two for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is complicated. I mean, I mean, the, the very idea that you would start with these, you start at the bottom of the Grand Canyon to teach us about mountains. That's there's it. there's you, a bit of a it. connection break there in, in the average person's mind, I would think. I would think if you want to learn about mountains, you would go to the mountains first. But no, in fact, there are, there are other places that give you these hints. Um, and yeah, that is definitely a different a different style of film than than the first movie. I mean, the first movie was very informational, very brief for each person. We each had one or two things to say, and that was it. One or two little lessons that we wanted to impart. And now you've got this one long sustained, yeah, one long sustained point with all of its little side canyons. I think that's a great metaphor. Um, yeah, it, yeah. So thinking then also, uh, there's, there seems to be sort of a a higher message, if you will, another message on top of this film. Um, that relates to just the way the creationists do our work. Uh, a common complaint we get, and Paul, you're very well aware of this, uh, creationists don't do research. You don't publish in real journals. It's not real science. There's no research. Uh -huh. Creationist research is just Google searching for some crackpot who agrees with you. And that's just, <laughs> that couldn't be more hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think this this film is sort of giving you this um, this window into this world. Now that was that designed that way? Did you go into this thinking I can use this yes. for that too? <laughs> yeah. So so remember, I said I often will do people do films for funny different things, right. and I did. So you listen to your daughters and. I, I don't like bullies. And so <laughs> I find that that's kind of like historically what I don't like. And so you may disagree with somebody, but for the first film, it was like, oh, these creation scientists, these guys are loons. They're all crazy. They're all dumb. And I was like, you know what? You're going to watch that film. And you may say, I might agree with them, but no one watches his Genesis history and says, these are dumb people. They say, um, I really struggle to listen to understand with this guy. Oh, and there's another one. Oh, and there's another one. Yeah. And I, I wanted people by the end, they got to the end of the vision of history to be so mentally exhausted and, but never ever to say that creation scientists were dumb. Like that was just like, we're going to address that. The second one was then to be able to address this issue. that creation scientists aren't scientists. And I'm like, I think we can address that too. Why don't we show them how they do their science? Cause guess what? The majority of people have no idea how science actually works. So in that sense, I wanted to be able to show them. And again, take that little subset of folks that say, well, creation scientists aren't really scientists and say, well, so what do you have to show for it? Because these guys are clearly scientists. Again, you may not agree with their findings and that's totally fine, but let's discuss it as not agreeing with findings as opposed to ad hominem attacks against them. Right. So they're smart and they're scientists. You just disagree with them and let's leave it at that. And then let's just debate the, the the data debate the interpretation of the data and get off of the you know personal vendetta comments about creation scientists so yes you can probably hear a touch of passion in my voice i the the things that annoy me are when people basically you know are abusive toward people because they really don't want to engage the argument yeah and and there it, it doesn't mean that creation scientists are right it just means that they should be they should be um met as scientists publishing material in a in in a way that science is supposed to operate, which is a peer review, engagement of ideas, and hey, what's maybe I'm not the normal science view. Maybe I am holding to a different paradigm, but maybe there are anomalies that you've got to deal with. And if you're kind of just want to paint over the anomalies, long history of science that those usually those views eventually go away because they aren't being addressed. So anyway. A little bit of a long... I, think, I think that's one that's one that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about the film that it gives people an insight into the process of how science is done. So you kind of go from 
you know, the field work and the sample collection and how you actually collect those samples and ensure their integrity. And then, you know, the making, even the making of the thin sections, we kind of see that happening, you know, how, how that process happens and, and the analysis under the petrographic microscope. You kind of see science at work. And I think that will be a, a real eye opener for people because I think lots of, lots of people just aren't aware of exactly how science is done. And I, th- I think that would be very valuable. I think it's great. It's funny. So Ray Strom, I don't think he'd ever been filmed. He said none of his stuff has right. ever been. We had to actually, this was, so we filmed Ray in 2020. We had to spend a special team up to Canada. No one could get in and out of Canada at this time, but we had a Canadian team we hired in Calgary that followed him along. But we've had so many people, non-scientists who say he's one of my favorite sections because I've never seen anybody do that before. And, and he's just so, I mean, if anybody Ray can be compared to is he's an artist. And, and there's an artistry to what he does. And when, I mean, even still, when I watch it, when he's using those saws and his hands are getting close, I will still watch it. And I know what's going to happen. I'm like, you're going to cut your finger off there. And he just, he doesn't, he just runs it every so perfectly. I mean, there is, and he's done, you know, what, 20, 30,000 of these in his lifetime. It's extraordinary. So, I mean, these are, and the, uh, the sad thing is that I say sad, it's a film. So you only have so much time, but Ray, in my interviews with him, he has, fascinating information because he's worked in the oil industry constantly. He talks about all kind of fascinating catastrophic stuff. Um, the ability, you know, because he's dealing with oil wells, the idea of how the, you know, he was talking about this often, how the sudden emergence of rock, the formation of rock within seconds because of chemical uh, com- uh, um, um, chemical solutions that hit, and all of a sudden an entire oil um a drill, you know, a, a well gets filled with rock because of the chemical, the chemistry. And he's people all been talking about how long this is. He goes, well, these guys, we've seen it happen in, you know, minutes. Whole thing gets stopped because of that. And he said, you know, one of the biggest deals is that people don't really understand how fast and interesting and unusual things are from the formation of oil, from the formation of so-called fossil fuels. You know, all of these things have a very, the creationist, I think Ray says this well, some in his very understated way, certain viewpoints had a certain deficiency. And he found that the, <laughs> the creationist viewpoint provided um, a new and maybe more helpful way of looking at things. And I, I really love that because I believe the future of science is in creation and that um, near and dear to your heart, Todd, you know, genetics and biology and the ability, you know, people even talking about, can you go find, you know, old creatures still embedded in genomes? Um, you know, the ability of what I just was listening the other day to a bacteria in the stomach and the way it deals with mood, but the way bacteria will borrow little um, sections of DNA from other bacteria so that it cre- can create the metabolites that we need to stay alive. It's like, and the guy was like, look, I don't, we, we can't even manage how this works because, you can't just go identify and say, oh, bacteria A creates metabolite, you know, A. Bacteria A may go borrow from these three and create metabolite A, B, and C. And the other bacteria may, it, she goes, it's a mass of complexity. So every time I hear this, I feel like creation is the only one that has the imaginative truth to give us where science needs to go in the future. And that a lot of the dead ends of science where we are today is because we've rejected an epistemology that has any basis in truth and testing and predictability. And then we've started to wander out where, well, it's a little more, oh, I want to find this to be my ending. So that's where I'm going to end. And we see this now enough times in the past mm, 10, 15 years of, you know, different views like, you know, climate change and all sorts of interesting things, you know, there in your side of the world, like was in the East, somewhere in England, they were doctrine views, you know, and like, well, I think these numbers are, we kind of want them to end up here. This isn't to say that, you know, there aren't some interesting things here, not to throw all the, the baby out with the bathwater. My point is that I think creationism is vital for us as a society and as a culture to move forward. And it's the only way to move forward with truth. So, hence, that's why I kind of have the lead of that into the film is like, look, these guys are doing good science and it's mm-hmm. actually useful science to us. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's really valuable. And you're right. I mean, Ray's a great guy. I, I was very fortunate, very privileged to 
work with uh, John Whitmore and Ray on the Coconino project. And of course, yeah. And of course, Ray um, processed our samples, you know, that we collected for the Coconino project produced, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of thin sections for us. And um, yeah, he, he's just, yeah, he's just a fantastic guy. And, you know, we had lots of great conversations out in the field and, you know, when we were in hotels together doing that, that work. So it was great to see Ray in the film. That's, that, that's a brilliant section of the film. Well, I mean, yeah. really appreciate it. we open up with the Coconino section and kind of yeah. tip, uh, you know, our hat to all the Coconino work and especially Ray's, we open up with a thin section. It was a curious little section that we opened up with, but I, I found it to be very efficient and it addressed mm -hmm. all my points in a very normal way. And that's as a documentary filmmaker, sometimes you can't always know what you're going to get, but mm -hmm. um, that scene where John explains what creation science is, and you see this idea of uh, basically it's a, just for those who haven't seen it, it's a thin section that reveals there to be um, uh, materials in it that uh, are basically in the, in this, in the sandstone that could only have been formed underwater. And another mm -hmm. geologist who is, you know, a conventional geologist sees this and knows kind of what it is, but realizes he can't admit what it looks like it to be because that would then logically then require him to go in a direction that he just didn't want to go. I've heard about this multiple times from creationists, um, you know, about how I'm just not going to go there yeah. uh, from a create, basically a, not a, a conventional. I mean, my favorite story is Kurt Wise's story of Steve Gould talking about Kurt says, Hey, I think punctuated equilibrium. I'm not going to get the story perfectly, but, I think punctuated equilibrium fits better in the creationist model. And Steve Gould says, well, Kurt, you, know, you may be right about that. But if you are right about that, then that means that, you know, then the fossil record's better explained by a global flood. And if there was a global flood, then it means, you know, the Bible actually is an accurate book. And if the Bible is an accurate book of history and science, then it means that the God who wrote it's probably still around. And then that means that there's probably going to be a judgment and I'm just not going to go there. Yeah. Like literally that's almost <laughs> Kurt, but he has more details, but Kurt gives the pieces. Yeah. And I'm fascinated with this, the idea of people will hold on to a conclusion because they need it, and then we'll fit the data into the conclusion and, you know, ignore this, pull this. And we all, in a sense, do this. But the consequences, though, can be very, very major for a society who, as we've seen recently with COVID, um, various people taking various views of reality and what are the implications for people. So... I often, you know, I'm a I'm an English major, so I see in the world metaphors and symbols everywhere. And so, if we have a willing to look, you're like, ah, that actually could be a, a learning moment there. Um, but anyway, all that to say. So, so you this moving on then, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> not that not that we can move on. It's not. It, it's 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 a yeah. It's a very different film. It's got interesting messages on top of interesting messages on top of interesting messages which i love i love the the idea of complexity and and being able to do lots of different things with just one simple with one simple thing relatively yeah simple that's I, I too do i'm sorry we were on the same page yeah. there that, that that's yeah. the eye. for those who want to see it it's there yeah yeah exactly so you're this film though you you did this differently than you did is Genesis history in another way, and that is by the funding. So yes. you launched, and this, I don't know that this was the first time this is ever done in creation. It might have been the second or third, but you launched a crowdfunding um, program, campaign, to fund the, basically the production of the film. So what went into that decision did that go well? Was yes. that a good idea? Oh, um, no, it was a good idea. It, okay. Well, so, yeah, I can speak to that. So the film itself, because we ended up, so most films have three stages to them. You've got the pre-production where you're kind of planning everything, and it takes a little bit of money to do that. Then you have the production, which is usually the bulk of your funds because you're having to go film it, yep. uh, depending on the, the the nature of your production. For Genesis is history. Obviously, we went to 21 locations. So it's expensive. Every time you go to a location, you got to pay for that and people and hotels and flights, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have the post-production. So, you know, these very clever names, pre-production and post. But post-production is your editing, your music, your um, color on the film, all the different parts and pieces, animations. So in this case, we had ended up funding 
the pre-production and the production. And in fact, some of it, you know, was funded by Alliance Defending Freedom to go down there. But we, because we did it slowly over about two or three years, we just internal on our company, we could, could pay for it and kind of move along. Um, when I got to the post-production though, this one was actually a bigger piece because of animations and other things. And the first film, we actually had investors that gave us, you know, they didn't give us money. You basically, it's an equity yeah. deal where they basically say, hey, if you make your film, we need to be paid back. Um, so, and that also goes to what you're, you know, print and advertising. So we were in theaters. Most people don't realize that, you know, you got to take a lot of money out to go uh, do that. It's often called last money in, first money out that they end up taking a, you know, 20% normally of whatever they gave you. It's a loan in a sense. You get not really a loan because you don't have to pay it back, but you do have to pay it back first. And so then you pay back plus. All those are costs. When we made the Genesis history, thankfully in the Lord's grace, um, we did well in the theaters, but just most people don't know this. It took us two years just to pay all our investors back. Um, uh, about that, 18 months, two years. And that's not common on documentary. Sometimes films just, you know, never ever pay everybody back. So we paid everybody back, but it just takes a lot. Documentaries are not high revenue films. Um, we're working with a distributor right now. He's kind of like, well, you know, I don't really do much documentaries. He's actually working with ours. It's on Amazon freebie and all this because it's kind of an evergreen, but it's a rare one. They usually don't make a, make much of anything back. To that end, we realized going back to investors would be hard on a film that I really didn't even know what it was going to be like. Is it going to even work in theaters? So I actually pulled us to even have a theatrical release simply because I didn't know when it was to be finished and I didn't know what it was going to be and I didn't know if it would make money. And it's post-COVID, which has been weird in theaters. Yeah. So I took that off. And then I said, we had developed a fairly large group within our Facebook, our email, and our YouTube channel, You know, hundreds of thousands of folks potentially. So we said, let's just set up our own crowdfunding campaign, offer some levels and see what happens. So we, we released it in May and by, I don't know, August, it was funded. So we had a very supportive group of people who were just very generous and yeah. had about over 1500 people put in money in anywhere from, you know, a couple thousand dollars, three or four. We had a few, I think a little more than that, uh, but the majority of them are probably a hundred, 150. Um, and we will mail out some fossils. We've been, well, so one of the scenes that we have in here is as John Whitmore goes out to his original PhD research in Green River. And so we actually made connections with uh, Tensky's Fossils, who will be promoting just a fantastic fossil company. And they shipped us over 600 fossils, fish fossils, you know, that we'll then mail out. And so we have all these, you know, kind of premium gifts, but um, so it's not, we have a, you know, a spread, you know, we probably 30% of what people give will end up going to their back to them for, for a, a purchasable item, but it's not a nonprofit. It's a, you know, it's a, they made a purchase. And so we take the money and we actually raised, I think about 110% based on what we originally wanted. So we wanted to raise 275. I think we've raised about 305 and the additional money helps go to, you know, defray additional costs and also for our eventual beyond is Genesis history volume four. So all to your point, yes, it was a good choice. The Lord yeah. was very gracious, but it, I mean, we we really have a very loyal, kind um, group of folks that have 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 supported us a lot and have been patient with us. The film has taken longer to finish. I had hoped it'd be finished in March, and result of you know animation slowdowns and other slowdowns, we we're, we're we're at the five yard line or maybe at the three, trying to push it over into the into the end zone, but we're close, and so. Late June, sometime around then is where I think we're now looking to get this thing out. Right, right. So it should be out somewhere about the time we have this done. Where, where uh, will it be? Lord willing. So we yeah. will likely have it, all of the usual suspects, um, you know, Amazon, iTunes, all of your... So okay. yep. videos today are served up in different ways. Yep. Um, you have, you know, TVOD, these are all names, SVOD, uh, AVOD. So these are all basically VOD is video on demand. So T is transactional. When you go to iTunes and you know you purchase $3.99, that's a transactional. SVOD, we're not sure if we're going to have a streaming deal, but like Netflix or Amazon Prime, these are streaming deals. And then um, A is actually a new interesting advertising video on demand. We ended up doing oh, this yeah. actually with kind of a an older products will do this sometimes, our is Genesis history. And so it's on uh, Tubi TV, it's on Amazon right now, freebie on YouTube. And so it gains a little advertising revenue through that. So, so, so it'll be, and then we'll sell it on our website. It'll be easily available on all the uh, main platforms. 
um, for folks to watch on their own. But at this point, we've not we've held off doing anything theatrical just because. Right. It just I mean, most people are watching from their homes today. And yeah. this is sort of a film that although, yes, it'd be great in the theaters and fun, it really probably will reward multiple viewings to kind of grasp all that's being said. Yeah, just like the first one. Oh, yeah. I mean, the yeah. first one was crazy. Yeah, the, the the binging, we got people would do it on Netflix and people would say, oh, they post on Facebook, yeah, I watched the film nine times, yeah. or ten times. And I'm be just... able to understand it. Yes. They're like, oh, like, yeah, I mean, it was, and I get it. It was, we broke a lot of rules in that we, we basically covered every, we, we covered everything quickly, which I felt like we needed to do because no one had really done this with Young Earth Creation. I mean, to take another, it's a consilience of induction. I mean, you had to put all yeah. the pieces together and that famous consilience and then say, no, our consilience is better than your consilience <laughs> um, in terms of evolutionary thinking. Right. So it's not, it's, it's not simple. And this is not, let's be honest, the Lord has not made a simple earth and we are, we're, we're a little bit simple people. <laughs> we like to think we're smart, but I'm, I've got a book I'm wanting to, for three or four years, I've been wanting to write why, you know, why is Genesis the best explanation for everything? And it, I, I'm going to start it talking about Alice in Wonderland, how we're kind of looking through the keyhole all the time. Yeah. And we don't really want to be the, believe that we are keyhole lookers, that we all really want to believe that we are in the position of God. And you're like, yeah. I think we're keyhole lookers and that we can trust that there was a good God that designed everything. And hence we just have the process of kind of figuring out what he already knew and did. Right. So. So in addition to the streaming options, will you have a, a physical disc for old dinosaurs? Yes, like DVDs. Me? Yeah. DVDs, <laughs> Blu-rays. Yeah, no, this is an interesting thing, Todd. So, you know, there is a line that we see 40 and above. Yeah. 45, they buy DVDs, they want a physical copy. That's right. Younger, they're all digital. Yep. Although, I got to be honest, let's just talk technical here. Your Blu-ray version is still way better than you can ever uh, stream right now. Oh, so absolutely. Blu-ray, oh yeah. I mean, so you got, buy, if you're going to buy, buy Blu-rays. Uh, they're great. I mean, you can't, the, the, the bit rate that you're getting and the quality, if you watch action movies, is totally unrelated, but you'll watch them how they kind of pixelate at times. They can't pass too much information. So if you want a good, clean movie, buy a physical copy of it. Yeah, DVDs absolutely. are probably not as great, but Blu-ray, which we will have, best way to go still. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, or 4K, you know, the Ultra 4K, if you're oh, getting yeah. into that. Yeah. I don't know if we'll, this will, we were not doing 4K on this, but yeah. Well, I mean, you did some of the, you, you inherited footage, so you had to work with. That which, is correct. A lot of this footage is a little no, no. different. GoPro footage. Footage yeah. from the canyon. It's just it, it, a lot of it we got was in although 4K. It probably was not high bit rate enough to carry it like we did our our first film was 4K, but we had a lot more control and a lot more um, uh, ability to have higher quality cameras sure, in these locations. Sure, sure. Paul, any final thoughts or questions? Well, one of the things that I did just want to pick up on, Thomas, if if you don't mind, was was and it was something that sort of struck me as I watched the the film you show on occasions uh, john whitmore with his students and you know how how do you kind of see the future of creationism this this sort of training of a new generation because that sort of comes out at times in in the in the movie the the need to sort of train up a new generation of scholars and researchers who are going to take on this uh, work in the future well, I, it, you know, it's interesting. This kind of arose after looking at the footage and looking at who we were interviewing. Um, but John Whitmore, someone has said that, you know, Dr. John Whitmore, a geology professor running the department at Cedarville University there in Ohio, I mean, he's been doing this over 30 years. He, so someone has said that he has personally trained more young creationists than anyone else um, individually, just because he's touched so many people coming through his organization for so long. Um, I think that that we need to look, and I know this is something that is near and dear, Todd, with core. <laughs> um, okay, I mean, you, you guys are, are are understanding the importance of of young cre creation scientists, young creationists, some of whom will be scientists but coming up. But I feel like we need to recognize the vital vital importance of putting money and time into training these young men and women to take these roles over. 
And um, it was just really worked out well to have this. And now what's, it didn't get mentioned in the film, but it isn't kind of interesting is that John's teacher, Steve Austin, is also in the film and has um, a, you know, a major segment. So you can see actually you know, first generation and second generation within the film. And then at the end, we actually you know, showed Matt McClain, who'd be a third generation off this now at Masters you know, a, a fantastic paleontologist. Um, but we, so we actually have three generations of creation science represented in the film. And to Todd's point, if you kind of have eyes to see, you can kind of look and see what I was doing with that. But um, Matt, I think, is one of the last people you see. And Andrew kind of makes this comment. We need to go, the, go ahead. Ironically, this was Matt being filmed when he's still a grad student at Hanson Ranch. And so Matt was like, oh my gosh, how young am I? But we filmed <laughs> Matt when we first filmed Art Chadwick. He was there. And um, because he was working, you know, with Art Chadwick and his dinosaur dig. And so I was like, I was thinking, oh, we've got that in our archives. Let's pull it up. So nice. It's important nice. to train the next generation. And there are some really fantastic, smart uh, young men and women that the Lord has blessed the movement with. But I do feel like it's really important that the older scientists focus on it. I remember. Steve was at one of our premieres and these, we had like 20 kids clustered around him. And he was like, yeah, I probably need to be coming over here and spending more time with some of these kids, primarily because it's easy to get focused on your research. You're a scientist, you're doing this, but to realize how do we create structures and opportunities to get, you know, scientists face to face with um, this burgeoning group of kids where it doesn't even take a lot of time, but in a little bit, um, that goes a long way. So I just feel like what you all have done, I mean, just in this conversation alone, uh, or on this Zoom call, you two alone are hugely influential um, and, you know, are, have an enormous role in doing this. I mean, so all to say, my thanks is to you guys and what y'all, because y'all are even by doing this podcast, are trying to put things back out and in and, and get get the word out and and teach it. And I think it's, what you do is very important. Even the very day-to-day -day mundane things have a huge long-term effect. Well, thank you. We certainly hope so. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so uh, much, uh, Paul. Yeah. Anything you want to mention? Well, I was just going to give Thomas the opportunity to plug uh, his website and the uh, and the blog. Definitely. Ah, yes. So, okay, we'll, we'll plug both. So the website is Genesis History. Um, isishistory.com is where we've got all of our stuff and you can kind of find anything you want there. But I will plug a blog that a new creation blog um, named after your book, Paul, um, is where it goes back into is that this is where students are basically writing. They're taking ICC papers um, and also republishing certain people's blog posts on a regular basis uh, who may or may not be on this phone, on the Zoom call um, and other things that have been written. So it's a group of young students that are, you know, we've got archaeologists and geologists and biologists that they're all in grad school or in undergrad, and they take ICC work, um, was an international conference on creation, technical papers, and sort of translate them down. Um, they take new topics and talk about them. And I think that's a that's where I think people should be looking, is looking at kind of this world of the uh, basically, if not cutting edge, but trying to take creation science and make it accessible to a wider audience. Um, and I think that that's a, that, that, that would be the blog. Newcreation.blog um, is where I would encourage people to go um, and look and see what they're doing. That's right. great. Yeah. Well, thank you out. so much for being with us. Thank you for joining us today. We It's a privilege. Always a pleasure. Yeah. It's an exciting time to hear about the new film. Um, can't wait to see how it does when it's finally released to the public. I think it's going to be really different and really eye-opening in lots of different fun ways. So uh, I hope it does well. We will pray for that. Uh, thank you. And thank you all for listening in our audience. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe, all that good stuff, and we will see you next time. See you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. 
Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.